The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will the Secretary please call roll? Senator Flores? Present. Senator Goichia? Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Pesina? Present. Senator Scheibel? Please mark Senator Scheibel absent, excused. We do have four members present, so we do have a quorum. And before we begin today on what will definitely be a water day, I'd like to provide some general housekeeping reminders. Please do silence your cell phones and electronic devices or Senator Flores will come down and answer your call for you. The public is advised that during meetings, legislators and staff are using laptops to view bills and exhibits and not for personal reasons. We're trying to be as paper free as possible, so please don't view this as a sign of inattention or disrespect. Please note that we require everyone to submit exhibits in an electronic format the day before the meeting. A few reminders about testifying before the committee. We ask that you do sign in at the table by the door. And if you're planning to speak today prior to testifying, do give the committee secretary your business card. Even if you're not testifying, you may want to sign in so that there's a record of who's interested in the Senate bills that we're hearing today so that we may contact you at a later date. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation and do spell your name as well for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you're done speaking. If you have handouts for the committee, you're asked to provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. We will be taking public comment at the end of each meeting. I'll be limiting public comment to two minutes per person to ensure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Please feel free to provide any additional comments in writing to the committee secretary so that they may be added to the record. Today we're going to be hearing three bills. So we have a lot of bills to hear today. So we do ask that everyone please be concise in your testimony and support opposition or neutral. After the presentations, we'll also be holding public comment. And again, just a reminder, please keep those to two minutes. We're going to begin today with Senate Joint Resolution 3, which urges the United States Bureau of Reclamation to consider certain actions, alternatives, and measures for the protection and management of the Colorado River. So I'd ask for the presenter, while this, this bill was, this Senate Joint Resolution was brought by the Senate Committee on Natural Resources, I believe that the Southern Nevada Water Authority is here today to present. So please come on up and thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Pazina, members of the committee. My name is Andy Belanger. I'm the Director of Public Services for the Southern Nevada Water Authority, and I'm here to present SJR 3. So as the Chair mentioned, this was a work product of the Interim Committee, Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. And uh, the committee wanted to make a statement regarding the Colorado River and its importance for this state. I'm not going to read the resolution or go through it in much detail, but it outlines uh, much of what's happened over the last year on the river and what's happened over the last 23 years with uh, unprecedented drought and aridification that's occurred and the impacts that that's had on our water supply. So the river is uh, very important for a lot of different users in seven states, two countries and many, many tribes. And uh, it's facing uh, very difficult times. So the resolution has four specific things that it requests. The first is that uh, it says uh, that the members of the 82nd session of the Nevada legislature strongly support the pursuit of a collaboration-based framework to address the structural deficit on the Colorado River. It urges uh, the Bureau of Reclamation to include mechanisms to account for evaporation and system loss in the Colorado River and in future management of the river. It urges the Recl uh, Bureau of Reclamation to amend existing federal regulations to prohibit the inefficient delivery application or use of any water from the Colorado River by all sectors and users of water, uh, to limit unnecessary water losses on the Colorado River, and it urges uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to consider and model the consensus-based modeling alternative that was submitted by the six states. Uh, it's an important resolution. Uh, the Colorado River is very important to, uh, to every Nevadan, and uh, I urge your support. Ready to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Bellinger, Belanger. Excuse me. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Andy. Great to see you as always. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when they had, you know, they built Boulder Dam, Hoover Dam, and that's in the 30s. There was no Las Vegas to speak of at the time. Uh, Las Vegas, 2 million people now. 
the the agreements that were entered into at that time wasn't there like a you know a review process every ten years or something? It's, it seems like we're still talking about an ag agreement that's almost pushing you know eight, 90 years old. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Andy Belanger for the record. Uh, yeah, the, the the Colorado River Compact was signed in 1922, so it's, it uh, had its 100th anniversary last uh, last fall, and uh, those allocations that uh, that are in the the compact and, and the Boulder Canyon Project Act that followed and, and then what's collectively known as the Law of the River really state what the, the allocations are for, for each of uh, the states that use the river. Um, and those allocations uh, haven't changed and won't change. Um, but there's a lot of things that the states can collectively agree to to address specific issues. And so collaboration um, is is really the most important thing on the river because what the seven states can agree to do um, to address the the unprecedented water crisis that we're facing um, is what's really necessary and so all sectors and all states that that participate um, and that work together to solve the problems can really uh, help resolve uh, you know the challenges that we're facing so does the Bureau of Reclamation have the ability, though, to override the 1922 agreement? I mean, we're, we're urging the United States Bureau of Reclamation to consider this. So I'm kind of wondering, what, what is their authority as far as reallocation of water on the Colorado? Uh, so thank you. Uh, this is Andy Belanger for the record. Um, what we're asking the Bureau of Reclamation to do is they're in the process of uh, revising through a supplemental EIS the the 2007 guidelines and what the resolution Can you please define EIS for the room sorry, thank the, you the environmental uh, supplemental environmental impact statement for the 2007 operating guidelines for the Colorado River and as part of that process they've asked the states to present an alternative um, and so what we're asking them to do is model that alternative so that the Bureau of Reclamation can review those assumptions and um, and make decisions that uh, consider uh, the recommendations that uh, that were provided. Okay, so we're just trying to you know make sure Nevada gets a fair shake in this new negotiation is what we're asking them to do. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, you can take a step away from the seat, um, and we'd ask anyone who has testimony and support to please come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Isaac Hardy representing uh, Nevada Conservation League. Uh, we are in support of SJR3. Thank you. Now that was some quick testimony. We have 10 questions, come back. All right, anyone else please come forward and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Zach Bucher for the record. I think I can beat that. Uh, we're also in support. Uh, the city of Las Vegas appreci appreciates what SNWA is doing, and we're in full support of this resolution. Thank you. All right. Anyone else here in Carson City? And seeing no one coming forward, BPS, is there anyone over the phones in support of Senate Joint Resolution 3? If you would like to testify in support of SJR 3, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much, Senator Gokachia. No callers at this time. Let's see if that holds. Um, all right. If there's anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition of Senate Joint Resolution 3, please come forward. All right, seeing no one racing to the front, let's see if anyone's joined us on the phone lines, BPS. Hello, 
Hello. Um, I'm so sorry. I was trying to do a support testimony. Is it too late? We can go ahead and take support testimony. Thanks so much. I will uh, keep it brief. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Paula Luna. I'm the operations manager for Battleborn Progress, and we are in support of SJR3. Uh, we know about the historically dangerously low levels at Lake Mead, and we know that this will allow uh, for us to address that water use as a group effort, and we ask that this committee supports. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone on the line who is in opposition of Senate Joint Resolution 3? You would like to testify in opposition to SJR 3. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Great. Anyone here for neutral in Carson City? for Senate Joint Resolution 3. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rorink uh, with the Great Basin Water Network. And you know, we're in neutral on this because you know, we, we admire what the, uh, what the SNWA is trying to do here. And you know, the notion of a consensus-based uh, alternative um, but you know there are uh, there are 30 tribes on the river. We're also dealing with the nation of Mexico, and you know just from what I'm uh, you know hearing uh, chatter on the river, there's uh, you know I if you don't have all those parties, I don't know uh, if you have complete consensus. And the same thing uh, with California. We're dealing with uh, with issues of present perfected water rights. Um, you know a lot of acrimony, and so it's going to be it's going to be tough. But I think it's admirable to start getting uh, the issue of evaporation uh, losses uh, under control there. But also, you know, we're here because of the issue of Lake Powell. And I think some of what we're looking at, we're going to see sacrifices to Lake Mead to, just to prop up Powell over the next couple of years. I think the good thing is, is that this is basically, as it relates to the consensus alternative, for two years. And then we got to look forward past 2026. But... You know, more and more, I'm just here to say, I think there's going to be a greater discussion about having one big pool on the river versus, you know, the Powell and Mead in the future. I think we're going to have to decide. And, you know, I choose Lake Mead every day of the week. And so I think this is just something that, um, you know, it's worth considering in these discussions. And it's, it's very admirable. And uh, that's all we have. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I feel we're swimming upstream in these discussions. We'll see how many terrible water puns I can make. Do we have anyone else in neutral here in Carson City? BPS, anyone over the phones in neutral on Senate Joint Resolution 3? You would like to testify neutral for SJR3. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Belanger, would you like to come up and make any? Okay, well, that's easy enough. I'll now close the hearing on Senate Joint Resolution 3. Look at how quickly we're making it through today. I also wanted to give a brief shout out. DRI is in the building today. We have Dr. Kamud in here who's done a presentation before. And let's give him a round of applause as well as the entire DRI team for all the hard work they do. If you haven't had a chance to check out the cloud seating operation outside or the setup on um, the first floor, I highly recommend it. All right, and with that, I'm going to open the bill hearing on Senate Bill 112, and that revises the provisions governing groundwater basin assessments, and I would welcome Senator Goakachia and any co-presenters to speak. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Senator Pete Goykachia representing Senate District 19, bringing you Senate Bill 112 today. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't realize it was going to be this tough to build a Crescent Ranch. We're just trying to make tools to 
help the water engineer out, but uh, the design is really tough. Uh, Senate Bill 112 is an effort to create a mechanism where we can generate funding for the state engineer's office uh, for the monitoring of groundwater in, uh, in this state. Uh, we've all seen this handout. Unfortunately, Senator Scheibel isn't here, but, uh, you know, this is kind of shows you our over-appropriated basins and uh, which ones are desi dedicate, uh, designated. But, uh, you know, again, this was the best data we've got. It was done in 21 using 17 data. It's not accurate. So this is where we're coming with Senate Bill 112, trying to get them a funding mechanism in place that uh, they can, in fact, start monitoring these groundwater basins on a basin-by-basin -basin approach. Uh, we've got one clarification we need to work on in the bill, and I'll just bring it up. It, it is actually, let's see, Section 3, and uh, it's in Sub 2, or Sub 3. We talk about a... A minimum charge of one dollar that's an existing statute and then we follow it up with a maximum charge is two dollars but that two dollars has to be on an acre foot charge rather than just a minimum uh, as and again that is as it pertains to an agricultural basin otherwise if you got a dollar minimum a two dollar maximum you got a hundred thousand acre feet of water being pumped uh, it's not going to work so again it's an acre foot charge and we need to clarify that and we'll have to amend that as we move the bill forward it, it is a one dollar minimum and the maximum charge would be two dollars an acre foot and clearly as you read the existing statute the board of county commissioners presently has the opportunity or the ability to exempt any bill that they feel isn't it isn't bringing in more value than what it costs to collect and so a board of county commissioners on one dollar minimum i'm assuming they're exempting those because it costs you what 55 cents to mail one right and uh, Get some staff time into generating so but again we wanted to clarify that uh, the, the minimum build is fine but the maximum is two dollars an acre foot we have some basins that have significant withdrawals and we'd be generating you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year at, at, at the two dollar maximum um, with that we want to make sure we're trying to clarify in the language that the assessment fee and this is a tax that is imposed by the county in that basin it's even though it's called an assessment until uh, the 1970s, it was called a tax. It is now an assessment, but it does go on your tax roll, and it is it does make is leanable against your property. And uh, if you've got a big enough water assessment that you haven't paid, uh, you can in fact they can sell your property. It's it's tax leanable. So we want to make sure that because you are paying that and you're paying for the uh, the monitoring to go on in that basin, that it is in fact used in the basin. And uh, really, that's the long and the short of the bill. It's, it's a mechanism to provide funding to, for the state engineer's office. It has to be used in the basin, and it's for monitoring of that basin, and it's paid by the users in the basin. And that's the long and the short of it. And we're, we're hopeful it will improve the data we've got on the ground as it comes to water basins and all the other dialogues we've been having on these other bills, whether the water table's going up, down, sideways, uh, we need data, and I, I think we are really challenged today with that data. If you don't have good data, you lose in court. I know that's great for the attorneys, but it's not good for water users. So thank you. I think Mr. Fontaine has some comments. Uh, to, and go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Pizzina, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Jeff Fontaine, and I'm the executive director of the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, and thank you for hearing Senate Bill 112 and to Senator Gokachia for his sponsorship. So as uh, Senator indicated, SB 112 makes changes to the Division of Water Resources non-executive budget account. So um, a non-executive budget account is like an executive budget, but it doesn't go through the same approval process. In fact, it's not included in the state's authorization or appropriations acts and typically doesn't include positions. And pursuant to uh, NRS 530-4040, the state engineer is authorized to levy a special assessment on water right holders in a basin that the state engineer is, has designated as needing supervision. Um, and the state engineer has the authority to determine uh, the basins, the designated basins in which the assessments are levied, how much is levied, and how the funds are used. However, one thing is, is clear, and, and that is that the assessments must be used exclusively for the expenses incurred in the administration, operation, and maintenance of the basin from which the money is, is collected. Uh, in 2019, the basin account revenues were used 
to support uh, three existing positions, and then in 2021, an additional $619,000 in transfers were approved to replace general fund dollars as a temporary alternative uh, as a way to provide about half of the cost of additional an additional five existing staff. The transfers at the time uh, were uh, supposed to be temporary, uh, but they are continued in the 2023-2025 biennium. And uh, we certainly understand the difficult choices that the division needed to make to support their staffing without having to reduce uh, staffing, but uh, the legislative record is clear that these transfers were uh, temporary and that the positions funded by the transfer provide statewide services to the public and should be funded with general fund appropriations in the long run. And uh, also based on the testimony, the impacts of the transfers would be that funding for those designated basins would not be available for the other things that the division really w wanted to do in those basins, including uh, uh, water level monitoring, keeping up with field investigations, and continuing the studies to evaluate the water budget uh, within those basins and, and having a continued field presence. So uh, also uh, the Division of Water Resources in indicated that the water basin district budgets would not be able to support the increases and in assess, uh, excuse me, uh, support the recommended personnel costs beyond uh, the current biennium without a substantial increase in those assessments and reductions in other services and functions in the basins. So that's the intent here is to um, make sure that those basin account revenues are used for the purposes of um, special supervision and administration of those designated basins in which they're levied. And uh, just walking through the bill very quickly, uh, section three, subsection two adds language to pro prohibit basin account revenues from being used to support staff who provide uh, statewide services and would otherwise be supported by general fund appropriations. And we do have an amendment, which I uh, hope is uh, posted on Nellis, but uh, th the amendment really uh, better clarifies what we really intend here and that these are really the classified positions appointed to NRS 284, so, um, which is Nevada's personnel system. So the positions that do work in the basin um, are non-classified and exempt from that statute, uh, NRS 284, and those positions are the ones that should be funded out of the basin account revenues. Subsection three caps uh, the maximum assessment on agricultural water users uh, in designated basins at $2 per acre foot, and as Senator Goykachia indicated, uh, this particular assessment is levied upon all taxable property within the designated basin. However, in basins where the groundwater is predominantly for agricultural purposes, the special assessment is on a per acre foot basis. So this bill, or at least this cap, uh, addresses only the assessments that are levied uh, in this way on a per acre foot basis. Again, we, we recognize the cost of administering the designated basins has grown uh, and it's costly for DWR due to inflation and, and growing number of issues. Uh, but we really need to address the financial uncertainty associated with an, an assessment on uh, water right holders that, that has no cap Subsection seven, the last uh, provision in this bill requires a state engineer to submit an annual report to each of the board of county commissioners which levies this special assessment. Uh, so the report would include uh, the expenditures and activities from the basin account uh, in that particular county. And we believe that this is necessary to bring greater transparency on how those basin assessments are both budget, budgeted and used. So again, thank you for the opportunity to present SB 112 and I stand ready to answer any questions. Madam Chair, if I may, just one quick closing comment. Uh, Senator Greg is here for the record, and I'm kind of familiar with Eureka County. And uh, in Eureka County, we have uh, six groundwater basins that are actually designated and assessed, and that rate is from 65 cents uh, in, in a number of the basins to $1.20 in Diamond Valley, and that's on a per acre foot basis, just so it kind of gives you some. Uh, they're, they're all different over the, all over the state, and... Uh, not every basin has an assessment, not every basin is, is designated, but uh, again, this is a funding mechanism to help the Division of Water Resources get their work done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just to confirm in section three, the minimum charge would be $1, not $1 per acre foot, just $1, and then the max would be the $2 per acre foot. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the committee? You stunned everyone into silence. Look at that. Um, I guess just one other quick question from me. Um, it looks like 
a lot of this is being done to bring in more funding to collect more data so we have a better idea of where we stand. Is that correct? Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Gorkachia for the record. And, and again, I, I just go back to the, the handout from Division of Water Resources. And, you know, you look at close to 100 basins that are overappropriated, overpumped. Over, they'll tell you over half of them. And I don't know what that number is, but I'm not sure how good the data is. But we're going to have to have better data if we're going to turn the tide. Thank you so much. If you'd like to take a step back, I think then without any questions from the committee, we are going to move to testimony in support. If you are in Carson City and would like to provide testimony in support, please make your way to the front. And stay, I guess, safe with that chair. It was very low the other day. For the record, my name is Nina Laxalt, today representing the Nevada Cattlemen's Association, and we fully support SB 112. We think it's long overdue that we get the data that's been so important to the entire state, whether it's been urban, rural, ranching, farming, however it's used to get um, a handle on the data that we've really been behind on and to provide um, DWR with the resources they need to, to help do that for the state of Nevada. Thank you. For the record, I'm Doug Busselman. I'm the Executive Vice President of Nevada Farm Bureau. A few years ago, the state engineer at that time called for the designation of a number of groundwater basins across the state. From the engagement of our members in those number of hearings around the state, we got a full load of organizational policy positions covering designated basins. Then last session, we witnessed the use of special basin assessments for funding activities within the Division of Water Resources, which took us back as being out of line with the purpose for acquiring the funds through the assessments that are made in some sort of the designated areas where these funds were acquired. We support SB 112 as being very appropriate in both terms of how the money raised should be spent as well as the transparency that should go along with the assessments in the first place. Our policy states that in a designated basin where the state engineer decides to levy an assessment, we believe that a local hearing should be held prior to the assessment to provide an explanation of what the fees will be levied. Additionally, our policy says that an, additional, that an annual report should be provided to the water right owners who have paid assessments to explain how their fees have been used. SB 112 is a good bill and provides requirements that ought to be basic principles in dealing with special assessments made in designated groundwater basins. We hope that you agree and will pass the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jake Tibbetts. I'm the Natural Resources Manager for Eureka County. And I'm speaking for Eureka County today. We too support the bill. Um, we support ensuring the state engineer has the ability to properly fund and manage the waters of the state. Um, but on the flip side, it's crucial to have full transparency on how the funding through the assessment, which is a tax, it, it's added to people's tax bills, how it's being spent and how any reserves may be being created. So how's the amount developed? What's its basis? What are at the, why are there discrepancies between assessments in one valleys versus adjacent valleys that tend to have the same type of management issues and the same similar type of workload? You know, currently a lot of this information is just not publicly available to those that are being taxed as well as those that are tasked with applying the tax, being the, the counties. And having that information, that full transparency would be very helpful and we really like that provision of the bill. We argue that if this transparency and these methods to determine the assessment were publicly available every year, that a cap may not be necessary because you are with full transparency showing how you're coming up with those values and how you're spending them so you can help justify what those costs would be. Uh, we stand ready to work with others, including the Division of Water Resources, for any language to clarify the intent and to address any concerns anybody has. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rorink with the Great Basin Water Network want to echo what was said. This is a government transparency bill and we hope uh, you support it. Thank you. Wade Polson, Lincoln County Water District. Um, 
we support SB 112. Uh, my board is the County Commission of Lincoln County. They're the trustees of the Lincoln County Water District. I get asked every year where the assessment fees go and what they're used for in our county, and I never had an answer. This bill helps identify that. And uh, because of that, we agree with the opportunity to be able to use the money in the basins that are designated in Lincoln County and be able to gather the, da the data that is needed um, so that we can move further in making those basins better. Thank you very much, and we support SB 112. Thank you so much. Is there anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 112? Seeing no one coming forward, BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines who'd like to testify in support of SB 112? If you would like to testify in support of SB 112, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, thank you so much. With that said, if there's anyone who would like to testify in opposition of SB 112, please come forward and be careful of that one chair. All right, everyone either likes this bill or they're scared of the chair. Is there anyone on the phone lines, BPS, who'd like to testify in opposition of 112? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 112, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, please press yes. star six to unmute. Caller, please proceed. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Berg. I'm the chair of the Well Owners Association of Nye County. As this bill is presented, we cannot support it. However, we do agree the, the changing of the funding the state engineer and the staff is well overdue. Uh, uh, this is a good way to keep, uh, keep these uh, offices in check. We also would like to add la uh, language to the, about the limitation that it does not apply to a signed well supervisor and their support staff. A max limit for agriculture users should be reconsidered and consistent with the mo monetary benefits associated with their water use. If the max rate is included, it should also include max rate for private well owners, and that rate should be less than uh, what's supplied to the agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you. BPS, is there anyone else on the phone lines in opposition of SB 112? The public line is open and working. There are no more callers at this time. All right. Thank you so much. Is there anyone who'd like to testify in neutral of SB 112? I'm looking toward the state engineer's office in DCNR. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Micheline Fairbank and I'm a deputy administrator with the Division of Water Resources and we are testifying neutral on uh, Senate Bill 112. Um, first, we'd like to go ahead and thank Senator Gokachia for um, bringing forth this legislation and having the um, opportunity to discuss the bill and considering revisions to the legislation. Um, overall, the division is supportive of the objectives of the legislation, that basin assessments be used for the benefit of the basin and the water users who are paying for those assessments. Um, the division does have a few concerns. Some of those have been addressed through um, amendments proposed. Um, 
with respect to the language in section three, subsection two, um, those our concerns with regards to that particular section have been substantially addressed by the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority's proposed amendment um, by specifically precluding the use of basin assessments for classified and unclassified employees appointed pursuant to 284 um, of the Nevada Revised Statutes. Uh, this eliminates the division's concerns with the original language. Um, the division, though, does need to note that if this language were to become law, and the current transfer of basin assessments into the division's executive budget account is not replaced with general fund revenue, this provision will result in the division having to make reductions in its classified staff to account for that budget shortfall. Um, the division is also has some concerns with the proposed maximum charge set forth in Section 3, Subsection 3, but we believe that this can be overcome with amendments. Um, first, we'd like to go ahead and thank uh, Senator Gokachia for acknowledging the confusion with the language as drafted, and um, we agree that you know having the $1 minimum and then the $2 maximum with per acre foot is the correct interpretation. Um, however, we do have some concerns that a $2 maximum would impact the division's available funding and likely to have an impact in the, um, in the relative near future. Uh, presently, assessments are really only, to are only um, sufficient to support staff salaries and associated expenses. Um, a $2 cap would inhibit the division's ability to enhance its data collection in the future um, or may possibly um, provide that impediment. Um, additionally, the division currently has assessments that exceed $2 per acre foot, um, as well as $2 per parcel, depending on the, me the mechanism of levying the assessment. And so um, we don't take issue with having a, a statutory mechanism that limits the uh, top end of an assessment, but we would suggest some, a conceptual uh, language that could limit the increase to a rate based upon the um, CPI or the consumer price index. And then if the state engineer needed more than that, he could go to a governing body to um, seek permission, such as the legislative commission. Uh, finally, conceptually, the division is agreeable to a periodic reporting. Unfortunately, the reporting requirement is set forth in Section 3, Subsection 4, will create an undue burden on the agency at this time due to how the division's non-executive budgets are established by the Treasurer's Office and how they are tracked through the state accounting systems and internally. Um, and these are significant challenges that we'd need to work through. So we hope to continue to have discussions with the bill sponsors and others to see if we can find a better way to approach this, and we hope this will also result in improvements of efficiencies for our fiscal staff. And finally, um, county commissions, uh, when we do uh, issue our, our assessments, we always make ourselves available to county commissions to answer any questions when those are heard before those boards. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Fairbank, I hear that you're retiring from DCNR soon. I wish I could say I was retiring. Um, I'm not retiring, but I, I will be leaving state service shortly. Well, thank you so much for your service, and I'm going to have you stay there for just a moment because I think we may have a few questions, but we're going to hear from the state engineer first. Oh, you don't have anything. Okay, well, then I think um, Senator Hansen may have some questions. What are you supposed to do? Well, I'm actually very sorry to hear that you're leaving, and I'll tell you right up, uh, off the bat, you guys are way understaffed. You know, we, we had the discussion about it. I'm hoping to get some more money. I don't want any of the questions I'm going to ask be considered a, a detracting in any way because I know, honestly, you, you got this big of a job and this big of a budget and this big of a staff, so it's a big mess. Question, 256 basins in Nevada. How many of those basins are dedicated basins? Designated basins? Hmm? Um, it's approximately half of our basins are designated. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I should, but I don't. But we'd be happy to go ahead and provide that specific number to you. Please. Now, uh, now you also have, if I challenge somebody's water rights, okay, I'm saying they haven't used them uh, beneficially. My understanding is you guys have a crop inventory that you're supposed to keep so that when I challenge somebody's water rights, uh, you, they're not using them. Do you guys keep a crop inventory? And if you do, how do I access that? You know, if I wanted to go after Senator Pazina and I are neighbors and I noticed she hasn't used her water in a long time beneficially and I want to challenge that legally and I turn to the state water engineer, is there a crop inventory that you guys keep? Adam Sullivan for the record. 
we do as much as we can with our within our existing staff and time to um, monitor and report actual water usage. So in most of those designated basins, we are able to do either a pumpage inventory or a crop inventory on an annual basis, and those are available on our website. Um, and um, in non-designated basins, we we generally don't do a crop inventory or a pumpage inventory, but we try to do periodic state pumpage inventories just to get a get as good of an estimate as we can um, based on the data that we have. So as far as challenging water rights, um, it, we do have those those records, and um, any time we were if we were to um, take some action for non-use, it would need to be supported by good data. Okay, well, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, the bill's about data, and do you guys have the data? If not, who does? I mean, if I was to do go to court and try to, you know, if my, if my neighbor here challenged me on uh, my, my attempt to take her water rights away because they weren't put, being put to beneficial use, I would assume you guys would have the data that I would use to successfully possibly challenge that in court, if you challenge me. Adam Sullivan, for the record, just, just to follow up on this, he, he, yes, and one clarification is you're talking about data on water usage or pumpage or be actual beneficial use, and some of the dialogue that we've been hearing so far on this testimony, I, I believe, is referring to data about water budgets like basin scale, recharge, and um, natural discharge. So there's, all of that data is important, um, and um, Yes, we do. We do what we can to. to well, that's kind of what I was getting at the beginning. You guys need some staffing, need some funding. I, I got it. I just want to try to figure out what we do have. Of the half of the basins, approximately that are dedicated basins, how many of those currently have an assessment? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Micheline Fairbank. Uh, so, of the numbers that ha are um, assessed, approximately ninety of those basins have assessments um, assigned to them. We do have designated basins that are not assessed, um, but there's you know, multiple reasons as to why that doesn't occur in those particular designated basins. Okay. And last question, Madam Chair. If um, of the of the basins of the dedicated basins, how many of them? Are, are currently over appropriated and of the ones that are over appropriated um, do you guys uh, is there like an additional duty or penalty or something or assessment um, for for excessive water use I mean how do you guys I'm kind of wondering on that assessment side can you use the assessment in effect if somebody's over pumping and a, and a basement or excuse me a basin is have more water sucked out than it's supposed to do you guys use those assessments in any way to almost as a penalty possibly uh, Micheline Fairbank, for the record, no. We don't use assessments as, as a penalty uh, mechanism. Uh, state law allows, if there's a violation of, of state law, there are um, enforcement mechanisms and penalty mechanisms uh, provided, but that's a completely separate process. The, the basin assessments are really utilized to support the work that's being performed and supporting the work being performed in those basins. So it pays for staff, it pays for, um, you know, we just are in the process of doing well run, so it, it pays for the tapes that measure groundwater water depth in those basins, um, multiple different types of things of that nature. But it's not a, we, we don't have a punitive use of assessments, and I don't think that's a, accounted for or permissive within the statute. Okay, let me phrase it. I, th I think I, I, I see what, what you're saying. If a basin is over-appropriated, are there any of the ones that are over-appropriated that don't currently have an assessment? Because obviously, they're, if they're over-appropriated, you guys have to do extra monitoring and stuff, I assume. So is there any of those over-appropriated basins that are actually are not being assessed currently. Adam Sullivan, for the record, generally no, and, and I'm almost confident that we don't have any basins that would fall into that category. You know, when a basin is fully appropriated, that often is a trigger for um, uh, uh, designating that basin um, as an area that's in need of, of additional administration. Um, so I don't believe there are any undesignated un basins that are over-appropriated. I know, but are there any that are 
at maximum levels that are not having an assessment is what I guess I'm getting at. In other words, are they paying, helping to pay for the monitoring that you guys are being forced to do? Are there any basins in the dedicated basins where they're over appropriation or at maximum that you guys are monitoring um, that, that don't pay an assessment currently? Adam Sullivan for the record. I don't, I don't believe so, but I can, I can look at that and verify it with you. And last thing, uh, a list of the over-appropriated basins. Do you guys actually have a list of them that we could see? I mean, you know, specifically out of the 256 basins, you said about half are um, potentially over-appropriated. Do you actually have a, a list that you can see of all the different basins that are over-appropriated? Adam Sullivan, for the record, yes, I, I do have that list, and I can provide that to you. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. If you wouldn't mind providing that to the committee, we'd all love to take a look. And thank you so much for your testimony in neutral. Ms. Fairbank, we all wish you the very best, and we've really enjoyed working with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Mr. Sullivan, did you have any testimony in neutral? Okay. Is there anyone else who, in Carson City who would like to testify in neutral at this time? And seeing no one coming to the front, BPS, is there anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 112, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Senator, would you like to make any closing remarks on SB 112? Thank you, Madam Chair. and. Uh, just one quick closing comment. I, I really believe, looking at the bill, that it would be the and uh, the concerns from the state engineer's office that uh, the the workload it would put on them to generate uh, that findings on how they spent the money out of a groundwater basin and return that to the uh, board of county commissioners. I do believe that would be an appropriate use of the assessment to use those funding dollars to help pay for the staff and and generating that report back to the to the Board of County Commissioners. It seems to me reasonable that they're assessing it. It should pay, pay for it. And then I'll just close this with, I appreciate uh, Senator Hansen's line, line of questions there and I look, look forward to some of that data. And then this is no easy bill. You know, I've got to go back to my constituents and technically I'm raising their assessment and their duty that they will pay. And you know, if you're pumping a thousand acre feet of water, this is a thousand dollar bill. So. You know, but again, they're committed to preserving Nevada's water resources. So with that, I'll close, and I thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and I guess I'll park here for the next bill. Thank you so much. And with that, I will now close the bill hearing on SB 112, and we will open the bill hearing on Senate Bill 176. Senator Gokachia, you're already seated and ready. Do you have any co-presenters for 176? If so, please come to the front. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Gorkachia, for the record, and uh, I'm uh, bringing Senate Bill 176 uh, forward today. I have with me uh, Director of uh, Central Nevada Water Authority, Humboldt River Basin Authority, Jeff Fontaine, as well as Jake Tippett, the Natural Resource uh, Director for Eureka County. There's been a lot of work went into this bill, and it's, and, and it's still we're still struggling with it. It's a very complex bill. It's going to be far-reaching. So I just will kind of open up with what we really intend to do. I, I believe this bill is a companion bill to a, Senate, a bill we heard earlier in this committee, uh, 113, the critical management bill. And again, if, if it, we hit that point where the state engineer is going to have to start curtailing junior rights, we have to have the ability to try to the extent we can to make those water right holders whole uh, or give them an option, maybe they'll never be whole, but at least give them the opportunity to keep their dirt in their house, uh, you know, and uh, even though they did have a junior permit. So uh, again, this is just, uh, this is a product of the fact that we are over appropriated and over pumped in this state. And again, all these bills are kind of focused on that. We've got to get an equilibrium at some point and some people are going to get hurt. Uh, Long and short of SB 176, it uh, and, and again we're going to get into it, and these these guys have worked on it day and night. Uh, again, it would allow the state engineer to, in fact, move out and uh, 
and purchase water rights from a willing seller, and I think that's the key, key piece, you have to be a willing seller, and uh, retire those water rights for the benefit of either of the, the water basin, the habitat, the environment. Uh, again, the key point is a willing seller, and I don't know where we're gonna generate all the money from. Clearly, it's not gonna be ba in basin assessments, uh, but it has to be done. We've seen this happen in other states, and I know Mr. Tippett is pretty much an expert in this field, and I, he'll be able to speak far better to it, but other states are doing it. When you're over-appropriated, and even to the point you're getting subsidence, you've got to address it, and the best way to address it would be retiring water rights, and let's get them off the books. So with that, I'll, I'm going to relinquish it to the experts in this. Uh, I know Mr. Fontaine probably go next. Uh, you know, he just kind of have some comments, but again, we're... I want to thank uh, Mr. Tippett from Eureka County. He's done a lot of work on this. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Jeff Fontaine with the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, and thank you for hearing Senate Bill 176. And uh, the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority has long supported the voluntary retirement of water rights, and um, we thank Senator Goikachia for sponsoring this legislation. So the map that Senator Goikachia showed you earlier, um, uh, I added up all those, I guess, red-colored basins, and it looks like there are about 56 over-pump groundwater basins in the state of Nevada. And um, we all know bringing Nevada's over-pump basins into balance isn't going to be easy, and we also know that the state's regulatory me mechanism uh, of curtailment is really a last resort uh, option, and we also know that that option has significant negative impacts on uh, junior, white water, junior water right holders and, and also communities. So we believe it's important to have in incentives as well as disincentives to, to tackle this problem. And establishing a state program for the voluntary retirement of water rights would be an important step in this effort uh, to bringing over pump basins back into balance and help those water right holders and communities and also benefit the environment. The um, the bill was really a very collaborative effort, and we appreciate all of the partners for their input, and especially uh, the help in, in crafting the proposed amendments um, that, that are on Nellis. And uh, with that, again, I thank you for the opportunity and appreciate very much um, Jake Tibbetts uh, in working on this with us as well and, and others. So um, I'll turn it over to Jake. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Jake Tibbetts again for the record, Natural Resource Manager for Eureka County. Um, and Senator Gokichia calling me an expert, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to pull the wool over his eyes, apparently. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, we'd like to step through the bill, but using the uh, conceptual amendment as kind of the baseline, so rather than the bill as drafted, if you don't mind. Okay. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, as you, you'll notice, I, I do want to uh, give thanks to the Nature Conservancy. I think you'll hear testimony from Laurel Saito later on this. And uh, Laurel and I uh, got together and took the lead on um, working with other stakeholders and talking to people about some concerns and clarity and other things that needed to be ad addressed. So while the title of the amendment does say Eureka County and, and TNC or the Nature Conservancy uh, Amendment, there's been a lot of input. The intent of this was trying uh, to address um, comments, issues, concerns, and just to provide some clarity uh, moving forward. We've also done a bit of research on some of the water retirement programs that do exist in other states and to try to borrow from or you know, steal from some of the, the good examples and maybe some uh, examples that aren't so, so good either. So there's, there has been a lot of work on this. One of the main things that we've heard um, through the effort is, you know, why, why should the state even look at any kind of funding mechanism for these water, these, like, say, junior water right holders that in the prior appropriation system would be cut off and just go away. But I think when you look at the context of over-appropriation and over-pumping throughout the state, many water rights holders, they, they, I can tell you, like, from Diamond Valley perspective, that there are junior water rights holders that didn't know they were junior until we got started in that process. 
they always they had a 1960 water right and they had always been told that was an old water right and that it was a good water right and they found out through this process that they're actually junior so many people over the decades they they applied in good faith for water they received those water they were granted permission we've allowed communities to be built on over appropriation we've allowed livelihoods to be established based on over appropriation and over pumping we've woven social fabric into many of these communities based on over appropriation and over pumping and frankly I think the state's culpable a little bit on that and needs to provide some soft landing ability for some of these folks with estate planning land use transitioning and economic mitigation so that's the intent behind a lot of this so stepping through the bill now madam chair um, with the conceptual amendment so the first couple sections section one and um, is um, most of these are just conforming changes in section two um, you'll see in the amendment there after having discussion the the language that was in the the bill is drafted used the term withdrawn for the mechanism of how to basically get water off of the books um, we do believe the proper term would just be to use the term retired um, withdrawn is a term that's used many times in the water law related to withdrawing water and and it just did cause some confusion the the different context in which withdrawn was used and then there's a portion later on in the conceptual amendment that tries to help clarify what retired actually means um, so you'll see section two section three both have those changes to just simply change withdrawn to retired section five of the bill um, is, is kind of the, the meat for the establishment of the the actual fund and so the amendment um, it's essentially to stand up the account for purchasing and retiring water rights so it'd create that in the state general fund um, as it reads now the account would be administered by the state engineer um, and I'll talk about some of those dynamics moving uh, later on in my testimony um, and as it read before it, you know it had the language we see in a lot of these uh, funding bills where it allows acceptance of gifts donations and and other sources of money um, again working with stakeholders we felt it was important to it specifically call out that it would could include legislative appropriations and federal funding and some would argue that those would be covered already in the language that was in the bill as drafted but it was important to, to call those out the reason federal funding is very important is other states that have stood up water retirement type programs federal funding becomes a big portion of that um, and again I've done, done a fair amount of research on some other programs that have taken place I have an article you know right here from the USDA and the, the, the title of the article says incentives to retire water rights have reduced stress on the high plains aquifer and it talks about some federal investments in Kansas um, and how that did uh, help benefit the groundwater aquifer there um, there's other been other studies uh, or other uh, case studies about how federal funds basically farm bill programming in the upper Klamath Basin there's the Northern California wine country there's the upper Metho tributary enhancement project there's the eastern snake plain aquifer in Idaho the Republican River in Colorado and then even more recently I, I do believe you'll get some testimony from the Nature Conservancy on on a program they're standing up in um, in the Harney Basin in Oregon and many of these the foundational funding mechanism is federal funding and the primary program available now is called the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program or CREP and it's a it's some ability to um, where the feds in most cases come up with 80 percent of the funding and then there needs to be a 20 percent match and it's more of a land retirement from irrigation it's not necessarily the water but there's some interplay there that we felt it was in, very important to in, explicitly include federal funding um, that in subsection three of section five what we're looking to to clarify there is that the fund um, can be used to administer the program recognizing that there will be a cost and some capacity needs for whoever whomever will be administering the program and then just providing clarity too that it is to purchase the water rights pursuant to this act but can also be to match funds um, say federal funds private funds and then also any other initiative that ends up retiring water rights that meets the intent again uh, there's a lot of other programs there that we'd like to be able to shoehorn into this program if possible um, one one concept that has come up that is not um, 
explicitly spelled out in the conceptual amendment, but is to provide an opportunity somewhere in here to allow for some more type of endowment management of funding, where, you know, rather than just putting it into account that there may be some endowment opportunities to allow funding to grow, you know, and, and to keep that endowment or um, corpus in place and, you know, potentially use interests and things like that. So that may be something we'll be looking at trying to build in. Um, and then typically, you know, the funding, we're uh, requesting for it to stay in there. It can roll over across fiscal years, provides the ability to go to the interim finance committee um, uh, to ask for funding from the contingency account if there's a need. And then we move into subs the new subsection 7, which is clarify the state engineer can enter into an agreement with any other entity, public or private, to obtain and manage the funding. There is concern um, from many that we've heard about the division being the regulator of water quantity in this state and then being put in a position of, of valuation of water, of uh, transactional transaction of water purchases and water retirement. And I think there's a, quite a bit of consensus building about, about ensuring there's that arm length um, arrangement with the state engineer and that they're disconnected from that process as both regulator as well as then somehow valuing water and and so we we do have some ideas to move forward on that so we're working to clarify that so the intent in seven knowing that it, the language isn't uh, perfect as it is but the intent is that if there's another entity outside of the division even if it's an entity within the state um, some other entity within DCNR or others that could manage this program and it's better uh, held in that other, that other agency that we're fully open to exploring that. Okay, then we move to uh, section six. You'll see we, we don't have a lot of changes other than some clarity, you move into subsection two. Um, the, the language we're looking for here is, is this identifies the priority. So if there's funding available, um, how, does the state engineer or how would this program go about determining where you actually put the money um, on the ground and purchase and retire water? And this is uh, trying to get to that point that we want to address groundwater basins that are over pumped as a main priority and to address conflicts with existing rights or detriments to environmental resources. So that's the clarity here. Also uh, the intent of the language here in, in subsection 2A is um, adding underwater rights being consistently exercised, meaning the intent of that is that it's wet water. The water that's, that's being pumped and that's causing the conflicts or causing impacts to environmental resources, that's the water that needs to be retired because it's the water that's causing, causing the issues. We, we don't want to get into the, the path of um, kind of a shell game of putting a lot of money towards something that doesn't actually benefit it. Um, and then, um, Adding environmental resources here is very important for, for many and a lot of the out external funding sources, whether it's farm bill funding or uh, non-governmental organization, foundational funding, man, much of that, uh, the money in this space is directed towards conservation and environmental type resources. And so that's the intent of that because we do believe that this will open up some opportunities for us um, outside of state money to, to bring some stuff in here. Um, and then just clarity that it's not, we want to look at currently exceeding, um, so we strike consistently exceed out because that could mean that a basin is actually not currently being um, exceeded of the, uh, or being over pumped. Um, and then the new subsection three is again just to hammer home, at least conceptually, that the intent here is to actually, the funding is going to good use, it's doing what it's intended to do, and that it's retiring wet water, water that is being used that is causing either conflict or impacts to environmental resources. Um, moving now, so that would re now shift the numbering, so I'm looking at that which would be now new subsection four. Um, some clarity on uh, uh, some discussion with the Division of Water Resources on if, if somebody comes forward and says, I no longer want this right, uh, groundwater right, what is the mechanism? And so just to clarify that it's either, it's a revocation or a relinquishment, but also providing some flexibility that it could be another appropriate mechanism as determined by the state engineer. And then precluding that groundwater from being reappropriated. We, we, if we're going to um, go through this effort and spend resources, we need to make sure that water doesn't come back on the books later. 
Um, the new subsection 5 is clarifying that it, the intent was that the consultation before the purchase and retirement of water rights is with the Board of County Commissioners. It, as drafted, it just said Board of Commissioners, and the, the intent behind that is it's the Board of County Commissioners. And then um, that would also require um, consultation with the uh, Groundwater Board if any exists. Moving to the new subsection 6, it's uh, basically just providing guidance and direction that if there's money available, the state engineer needs to move forward with good faith and reasonable diligence to actually move, use the money and start getting water off the books. But it has a caveat there that if the state engineer can say no or there can be that kind of stop sign put up if there is a circumstances where the amount to purchase and wa retire water rights just becomes excessive. Um, we have heard concerns from others about potential gaming of the system. Uh, uh, artificial inflation of water right values and eventually you know funding not really a lot of money going towards a uh, trying to solve a problem but you're not making any progress because the amounts get so excessive the new subsection 7 um, this was before it allowed uh, it required the state engineer to adopt regulations which it st still does but it now has some discretion where the state engineer may adopt multiple regulations the thought behind this is there will likely be overarching regulations um, for the program as a whole but there may be specific nuances needed for any specific given area so say a, a funding pool became available for the Humboldt River Basin as an example there may be, need to be specific regulations on just that funding pool for that specific set of basins or, or river basin um, so it provides that flexibility for multiple regulations as necessary. And then the intent behind the rest of uh, subsection 7, new subsection 7, is to put some sideboards and requirements of what would be in the regulations, which would include a stat, uh, the procedures of how value will be determined or a range of values, what, what is the definition of water being consistently exercised. That's, again, what is the definition of wet water. And the example I'll give you is um, that we heard is if you have a farmer that's, they have water rights on an entire uh, 160 acre quarter section, typically. And if they put a center pivot irrigation system, they do not irrigate the corners. But they're effectively using the, prime, the large bulk of their water right on that full section of ground. So the intent here is to help clarify, you know, through the regulatory process to determine, you know, perhaps that whole 160 is substantially exercised, consistently being exercised, even though you're not farming the corner. So that would be an example of some clarity that could be provided through the rulemaking process. Um, and then ensuring that we really want to make sure that any of funding that becomes available, that it actually does what it's intended to do, that it avoids conflicts or addresses conflicts or with existing rights or the public interest or detriments to environmental resources. So we want to make sure that the regulations also help us to put a good um, cap on um, ensuring that the, the money is going to good use and actually doing what it's intended to do. And then um, the subsection or seven sub D, that's intent with the understanding that if uh, a private foundation or a non-governmental organization or even a federal funding pool became available, there may be specific requirements of that gift or that uh, bequeath or that grant. And so there may be um, necessary provisions like a, a regulations developed to ensure that that specific pool of funding is done in a way that's in compliance with whatever the gift was or the grant was. And then uh, so the new subsection 8, and this really gets down to, as I mentioned, trying to keep that arm length separation with the state engineer's office, allowing them or whoever it's in, uh, this program would fall under that they can transact or contract with the third party person or entity to, you know, the, ex the expertise to help develop um, what that cost would be so they can kind of stay out of that process. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you, you know, university expertise and ag economists and others that could be very helpful in this space and having that ability for the state engineer to do that we felt was important. And then nine, uh, the new sub nine is to give some breathing room to get this done. Um, we do know there, you know, there this to do rulemaking and a lot stand up a whole new program. It takes time, and we want to make sure the state engineer has the time 
to be able to stand up the program, get the regulations in place so when we start moving forward with actual retirement of water, it's done correctly. So there's a two year window there um, where the state engineer could move forward um, after the effective date of this act to develop those regulations. And then the last, um, the bill stands as it is except um, section nine and all we're uh, requesting there is to make it clear that any appropriation um, that the legislature would put forward f to stand up this program could include a reasonable cost for administration of the program. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. All right, I've got one to start and then I'm going to hand it over to Senator Hansen. Have there been discussions with any of the water rights holders about a potential of a program? Has there been any interest in something like this from any of the water rights holders that you've heard? Uh, yes, definitely. There's, there's interest in water right holders. Unfortunately, the value is, is how much you're going to pay. And, uh, you know, clearly, if you're a willing seller, uh, you know, if you're talking $10,000 an acre foot or you're talking $300 an acre foot, there's a huge difference. I think you find a lot of willing sellers that will participate if you've got a high enough value. Clearly, that's not what this program is meant to do. I think we're, we really need to stand this up in the event as we come forward with balancing these groundwater basins. As Mr. Tippett said, the state does have some culpability here. Uh, they issued the permits in good faith. These people have been there 50 years, and ultimately they're going to face curtailment. And so can we have, give them a soft landing? That's kind of where I'm looking at. But uh, no, there's people are interested, just waiting to see how much it pays. I do have um, one follow-up as well. Based on what other states have done or your research into other areas that have looked into something like this, is there a standard per foot cost that others have been using or does, is it, does it just run the spectrum? Yeah, Madam Chair, Jake Tibbetts for the record. So yeah, thanks for the question. And it would run the spectrum. So, you know, looking at this as, as Senator Gokichia mentioned, you know, pairing a, a potential retirement program with the critical management area designation, you know, you give people a critical management area designation and it starts at that 10 year time frame. And people are going to be very incentivized to do something, either come together and try to develop a plan or a state planning or whatever it is. But they know at the end of that 10 years that something's going to happen and likely a curtailment if they can't come together. So this, it, every basin's going to be different. Um, it, and it, it has been in all these other areas where it's been done. It's not the typical valuing of water rights that somebody's going to buy and continue to use. It's a, it's a whole different um, paradigm we need to look at here. I, I, I do think in some cases, the values would be, let they're, they're gonna be less than fair market value for the actual price of the water to continue to use it because the al other alternative is the junior is gonna lose it 100% through curtailment. So this is a, a payment to soften the blow. Um, so, but it is a case by case basis. Um, I can tell you, based on your previous question, that in Diamond Valley, before we were ever a critical management area, so when Senator Goikichia sponsored AB 419 in the 2011 session, we had already started with efforts to do just something like this on a localized level. We brought in a, a, a economic analyst, uh, analyst that did a couple of uh, feasibility studies for us to determine how we could potentially um, create like a general improvement district to self-tax and raise funds to retire water. And so there's, there, it, but it basically does run the board on, depends on the valley, depends on the context of where you're at. One last question and then I'll hand it over to Senator Hansen. Um, so what we're looking to do in state, would there, <sighs> I guess, would the price per square foot or, or what we're paying for the retirement rights vary by basin within the state as well, or would there be one set rate for the states? How do you envision this? Well, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to these guys. I envision every acre foot of water you buy could be different or, or at each from each purchaser. You know, there's going to be people that would realize that it's the end and uh, it's going to allow them to keep their property and their house. And, and generate some money out of the water rights that are going to be written off. Uh, you might go to the next guy, and he might be in a little better position, a little harder. But again, it's going to be fair market value, and it's going to be, I hate to say it, it's a fire sale of water at, at that point. That, those are the ones who are going to retire. Thank you. And my last water pun of the day is it really is sink or swim. 
All right, Senator Hansen. Well, it's pretty good, actually. Keep going. Um, no, this is a giant mess, really. The more I think about it, sitting here, because, okay, and the reason that Jake in particular, since you've been doing a lot of homework in other states, here's what I'm looking at, okay? Um, you're going to buy my water rights because I'm junior. But my water is being used to develop my property. So when you take my water away, you're really eliminating the entire value of all my improvements. You know, I can keep my house, but essentially you're taking away my livelihood, you know. And so the real value isn't just the water, it's the property and everything else. And so when you start looking at it that way, I'm going, oh, what a mess this is financially. Um, question um, other states, how they, they may have done that. And the other next question is, when somebody gets a water right, maybe the state engineer will uh, answer this, is there an explanation at the time that you get water rights where there is a warning, basically, that in worst-case scenarios, you could lose those water rights? And I'll explain why after you answer those two. <laughs> Thanks. Jake Tibbetts for the record. So, Madam Chair, through you. Um, so you Please always, go direct. You Thank always you. ask the real tough questions. You make it hard. <laughs> no, but the, the, some of the other programming in other states, like the federal, most of this is through federal funding, and the state matches it, and the feds, they, it's not a buy and dry type, in most of these others. They're requiring the transition of that land to, with some other types of um, cover vegetation, so it's not just a payment and walk away. You know, this build has, doesn't require any of that, but I think that's getting to some of that what do you do with the land after you've pulled the water off of it? Right. And so areas like Diamond Valley, you know, there are other grazing type um, agricultural opportunities on those lands, even without irrigation. And I think that'd be the case in many of these valleys. So it's not just, you're no, gonna, no longer gonna have agriculture on those lands. I think there's an opportunity to transition to more dry land type uses like grazing. Um, and then I kind of forgot your second question. Well, the second one, when, when I get a water right from the state engineer, does, is there some kind of a disclaimer in there warning me in advance yeah. that the state engineer can, in fact, shut off my water? And maybe that's a better question for the division. I'll, I'll, from, from my perspective, again, Jake Tibbetts for the record, um, there's every permit has a, talks about it subject to existing rights, every, every permit granted. Um, so while that is in every, even the very most senior person has that in their permit. The issue is some people, you know, they applied in good faith and saying, I want to put, drill a well here and put alfalfa in back in the 50s or 60s. And they were granted the ability. They didn't know where they stood. There was, you know, the reconnaissance series reports were still young or not even out in many of these basins. We didn't know the perennial yields in some areas. So many people became junior by the effect of later on we determined where the line was. At the time, the line wasn't drawn. People were applying in good faith, and like I said, we've established whole livelihoods and communities and social glue in many of these communities based on over-appropriation. And well, that's got, what this um, is. Believe me, you're yeah. preaching the choir. I, I'm in complete agreement with you. I didn't mean to cut you off. The question I have is, if this was taken to court, okay, and it's a takings case, um, the state engineer comes and shuts down the Ira Hansen alfalfa operations, and, and other states have... And then, but I've got a contract from the state basically saying, warning Mr. Hansen in advance that if this basin is overappropriated, I as the state engineer have the right to come back and shut down your wa water usage. Have other states or the courts actually ever addressed that? Uh, Jake Tibbs for the record. So that's what Western water law is, is the prior appropriation is first in time, first in right. And so that's the context of it. There's, you know, various shades of curtailment that have taken place, and many of them that I'm aware of, you know, I'm an eastern Idaho boy and born and raised on the Snake River Plain and, you know, have a, a family farm and ranch up there that's very well aware of what's going on there. And a lot of times these curtailment processes end up in some kind of um, settlement um, where it's more structured. But that is the context of water law is... You know, if you're junior, you get cut off, and that your recourse is nothing because that's well. That's what I'm getting scared about. Because really, when you start looking at the dollar amounts you guys are talking about, if if I have have been even if I've been there 50 years, 
if the basin is ultimately over appropriated and they start basically shutting things down and I say this is a takings because I've done all these things, my community's based around it, et cetera, have there ever been a court case that said, yes, that is in fact because of bad faith or, or mistakes on the part of the state engineer, you are entitled to a takings claim and they have to re recompensate you not only for the loss of the water but the destruction of your ranch or whatever. So I'm, I'm looking at worst case scenario here, see. Yeah. As I look at this. Mountain Chair Jake Tibbs, I'm not aware of any specific case where a junior was cut off and then said, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have been, or they, they came after the state. I'm not aware of that. Okay. And Senator Hansen, we might refer that to our legal. legal. Yep. Yeah, I Thank agree. Um, last, last real quick, the, the federal side of this. What, I mean, for all states' rights guys like me, it's always remarkable how much in Nevada we rely on federal funds, <laughs> right now even. Um, what's the involvement? I mean, why would the federal government get involved in overappropriated state basins? So, Madam Chair, Jake Tibbetts, for the record. So, most of the, in fact, all the programming that I'm available of uh, or aware of, excuse me, aware of, are all farm bill programs. And so, it's that that whole model of incentive-based um, conservation. And so, it's not. None of these are mandated programs. They're whoever they're run through the. Uh, FSA, which is the, um, slip my, yeah, uh, fed, farm yeah, farm services agency. I want to say federal services, <laughs> farm services agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So that's programming through there, but they're not they're not a regulatory agency. Those agencies are. They're they're about providing incentive payments to help conservation. So at least all the programs I'm aware of are through through, through the farm bill. Okay, well, I was just curious, but now the whole thing's kind of scary as I look at the bigger and bigger and bigger picture because we're running out of water and we want to shut everybody's wells off, or, uh, but there's, when you, you know, there's major ramifications, a ripple effect that's enormous financially too. So anyway, obviously I represent a ton of rural areas and I want to, I want to make everybody, you know, the landing as soft as possible as we ultimately start to curtail water use. But in the meantime, how do we fund it and so forth? You know, it's not just a matter in my mind of buying surplus water rights or, or, or water rights in basins that are over appropriated There's, because that water is being used for dramatic levels of improvement that will go away without the water. Plus the value is that as, the, as your neighbors find out that your property values may be going down because they're taking your water, your ability to sell your property also declines. You know, grazing land versus alfalfa pivots, you know, if you can keep, you know, one cow per 10 acres versus uh, how many tons of uh, alfalfa you can grow, it's substantially different. Sorry, Madam Chair, for rambling. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, seeing no further questions from the committee, we thank you so much. Oh, wait, so sorry. Senator Flores? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and sorry for not clarifying that I had a question. Uh, thank you for the bill that has overwhelmed all of us. And um, in, in preparation, Again, because I am so new to the committee, I, I try to identify other states that do this now and, and how that works. And one of the states that I was looking at it was Colorado, and I think, and they, they call it different things, what, retirement of water rights, buyback programs, and uh, I've seen it used differently. Um, and I think when I was looking at Colorado's model, they have a, the Water Conservation Board, I think is what they use there. And uh, on top of or next to the uh, water retirement program. They also had uh, alternative transfer methods and there's these other things that they also have. And, and the reason I'm asking about that is I'm trying to wrap my head around kind of the, the, the macro conversation, which is I'm assuming that when we talk about retiring water rights, there is a simultaneous conversation about what are the alternatives happening at the same time, whether it is working with a farmer and telling them, here's how we can change some methods of what you're doing now to, to better utilize what you need to accomplish while also uh, working with us on conservation efforts. Um, and so I'm trying to understand how you see that relationship working. Uh, I, I also see, um, I think in this bill, I think it was just in section three, the only time we, there is a mention here, and it's not your new language, but it, the only time we we see perennial yield is here, I think, in I think it was line 13, um, and that's just current language. But I mentioned that as well because 
every single time I, I try to engage in this conversation, I have a hard time, particularly in a conversation about retiring water rights, um, when I feel that there's so much other things that we, we still have not adequately defined. So I think of even of a scenario where, where I may have a lot of land and I may have X right to water. And in that scenario, I, I take advantage of this program. I get paid X amount for it. And then all of a sudden, uh, a few months down the road, we, we change how we define perennial yield. And all of a sudden, uh, what we thought we were over-appropriating, now we're in a whole different world. So I'm just, uh, before we hit this, I, I, I have a desire to try to create real parameters that we're all going to kind of be working under and abiding by. Uh, so if, if, if you could maybe walk me with some of that, and I know some other states have, have gone into kind of some of these deep philosophical conversations in a very different way, but if you could uh, help me kind of get, get around that a little bit. Well, I'll take uh, Senator Gorkachia for the record. I'll take a real quick stab at it because, and, and very brief, because again, these guys are far, far, you know, we, but yeah, these programs are working in other states, uh, retirement programs, water buyback, uh, Utah right now to save the Great Salt Lake. Uh, they're actually leasing that water back for uh, one year, two year, three years, up to $3,500 an acre foot. You know, they're paying them. Don't, don't use it. Send it to Great Salt Lake, which is fine as long as you are do it in the five-year window and so you don't lose your beneficial use. You could probably rent it for two to three years. Uh, the problem is I think that sets us apart from some other states, and not all of them because clearly the Og Oglala Aquifer, but we are at a point where the basins that are over-appropriated are so badly over-appropriated Pure conservation efforts, just like you're talking, you know, yeah, re-nozzle, you know, we can cut it back to where we only need, you know, two acres feet instead of four. That won't balance these basins that are so totally over-appropriated and, and over-pumped. And, and that's, I think, why we're really looking at this bill. Stand the program up, and I agree with you. Let's see if we can find a way. This is going to be a couple of years to get it stood up, probably five years before it's ever accessed. But let's see if we can get there. Yeah, there are... You, let's not move away from conservation or any other mechanism, but the bottom line is some of these areas are going to need to be retired, in my mind. And, and before you, you jump in on the conversation, because you're much more informed, and I, and I know that you, methodically you'll be able to walk me through some of this, but, but if I could just go back to even the concept of over-appropriation. Even there, it, it alludes to my concern, which is, because we haven't done enough of a foundational framework, right? I, I feel because we haven't done that, we are where we are now. And so my concern, and, and it's not even a concern with this bill per se, I just want to understand how this bill uh, will stand alongside of the foundational issues that we have in water law in Nevada. If we're not getting to the core of the issue, I want to understand how this is going to have the impacts that we desire uh, because we, we have a whole history of doing everything wrong, I feel. And if that's the issue, you know, if we keep building on top of what we've done wrong, it concerns me that we're not getting to the real root right, of, of what we are hoping to accomplish, and not to minimize this because I know other states are doing it. And, but I, I just, because I'm having a hard time with the foundational issue, is when we start building on top of it is what concerns me. If you could please help with that. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that for the record, Jeff Fontaine. Um, well, I think we all recognized uh, what happened in the past and, and why. And I was telling Senator Kokachia that, you, you know, there was a day under the Desert Land Entry Act where these types of um, irrigation operations were encouraged. Um, and uh, and so they needed water, and, and, and the state engineer at that time uh, issued a permit to pump groundwater. And maybe they issued more permits than they should have, but at the time there was an expectation that not everybody that got uh, Desert Land Entry Act uh, permission to irrigate the desert was actually going to do it. And so there are lots of reasons why I think we're in the situation we're in. And foundationally, I think to your point about, uh, you know, the data and the understanding of uh, hydrology and, and, and the needs and monitoring and all those kinds of things, we've evolved to the point where hopefully 
you know, we at least can, can measure better what's going on. And, and, and again, there's, there's certainly a lot more that we can do. But um, as far as how it sort of, you know, aligns with existing law, I mean, it really is about the prior appropriation doctrine because the day of reckoning is coming for a lot of these basins. And that's why this bill focuses on the overpump basins. Sooner or later, um, they're either going to be declared a critical management area or there's going to be curtailment. And, um, you know, we've got a little bit more time perhaps with some of those basins that are overappropriated, but not necessarily overpumped. But for those that are overpumped, something has to happen. And so that's the whole point here is let's get in a position where when that day does come, and, and, and maybe there are some, some, some opportunities for some of these overpumped basins to, you know, uh, voluntarily reduce pumping, conserve water, and do those things to get it back in balance. But unfortunately, there are those basins that no matter how much you conserve, there just there needs to be that drastic measure. And so the idea of being able to help those folks out that have invested their lifetimes in, 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 um, in those communities is, is really what this bill is about. Madam Chair, may I? Again, uh, Jake Tibbetts for the record. So, and I, I hear you loud and clear, Senator, that, you know, we shouldn't just jump to retirement without doing what we can, you know, pushing the limits of conservation first, right? It shouldn't be just finding a buyout first. But um, I just want to recognize the tremendous amount of work that is going on statewide in that space between, you know, we've got our, our conservation districts throughout the state, um, the, the, various ag producer groups that work in this space and then you know our our land grant universities we got the um, cooperative extension the ag research um, that's going on in this conservation space how we can push the limits of that and a lot of that's going on and there are farmers that really are doing i mean it's amazing what they can do um, you know again at the limits of conservation but i'll just echo what has been said in some areas we cannot conserve our way to a, a balance by doing that water has to come off the books um, the the other thing too i just point out too is in subsection two of um, section six that is the, the intent of the, is the prioritization. So if you look at the priority going to 2 sub A, it's where water is being, so pumping is uh, currently exceeding the available supply, but it doesn't just mean just because it, you say there's over pumping, it's also to address conflicts with rights or detriments to environmental resources. So it's to address things that we're already seeing. So on that, it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. We're seeing impacts with senior water rights. We are seeing uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems being affected. So that's the priority is, you know, having better numbers and things in that con We know there's impacts. So we, that's where we want to focus. Then if you look at sub B, it's any other groundwater basin. And that's where, you know, if pumping were to exceed the available supply, it could create you know we want to avoid impacts to rights and and detriments to environmental resources so we really are trying to focus triage in areas where we know there's already conflicts and impairment of environmental resources taking place thank you thank you madam chair Thank you so much, Senator Flores, and thank you so much for your responses. Um, with that, if you'd like to step back from the table for a moment, we're going to accept testimony in support of SB 176. All those in support, please come to the front in Carson City. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laurel Saito, and I am the Nevada Water Strategy Director for the Nevada Chapter of the Nature Conservancy, and it's our pleasure to speak in support of Senate Bill 176 that establishes the Purchasing and water, Retiring Water Rights Program for Nevada. Although Nevada is the driest state in the nation, we are fortunate to have many groundwater aquifers that provide a buffer for droughts and climate change. And they also supply drinking water and economic benefits for people, and they also support groundwater-dependent ecosystems that rely on groundwater to maintain their ecological structure and function. 
as you've been hearing, Nevada has about 2 million acre feet of available groundwater, but almost one and a half times that have been appropriated as water rights. This is concerning for plants and wildlife that could be affected as water stored in aquifers declines. Our recent assessment of stressors and threats to groundwater dependent ecosystems in Nevada found that 20% of Nevada's groundwater dependent ecosystems are in groundwater basins that are over pumped, and 39% of the over 6,000 wells we analyzed had significantly fallen groundwater level trends. The Nature Conservancy supports enabling tools to resolve overuse of groundwater that can affect water availability for plants, wildlife, and people. We need tools besides curtailment by priority because curtailment may not resolve conflicts with existing water rights or impacts to environmental resources in a timely and effective manner due to the nature of groundwater movement and connection to surface water resources. SB 176 establishes a voluntary program for water right holders to retire water rights that cannot be available for any use in the future. The intent of this program is to retire water rights that are actively being used, in other words, wet water. We have worked with Senator Goikachia, Eureka County, and other stakeholders to develop language in the friendly conceptual amendment that will make this an effective tool for addressing groundwater overuse in Nevada, and we are committed to continuing to work on the bill. The Nature Conservancy also stands ready to assist the state in enacting this program by seeking funds and implementing projects that can demonstrate effective groundwater retirement. We urge your support for this important legislation. Thank you. Will Ladler, representing Silver State Government Relations and uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. Uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe would like to thank Senator Gokachia for bringing forward uh, Senate Bill 176. Uh, it is not a clear path forward today. We will say that right now. And the funding system is not clear either. But I, I would like to encourage folks to, to look at this as the first step towards the future of trying to, to fix the, the greater problems in Nevada. Uh, Pyramid Lake is, is an example of this as the Truckee River is the most overappropriated basin sort of continually uh, fought over water in the world probably. Um, Pyramid Lake had to actually have a lawsuit at the federal level dedicate water rights to them so the lake would continue to be filled with water. That was considered impossible at the time. So I would just encourage folks to say, you know, let's look at this as the first step towards fixing the impossible and coming to a conclusion to some of these water rights issues and hopefully federal funds and other things can be accessible in the future to, to fund this account. But I, I do think it's a, a good step in the right direction to sort of retire the wet rights that are, are sort of, you know, causing the harm of overappropriation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rorink with the Great Basin Water Network. Uh, we support this bill for a lot of reasons. Um, but, you know, money doesn't solve uh, all problems, but it can make life a little bit easier. And I think, you know, as it relates to this, we need to help make up for the errors uh, of, of the past. And, uh, and this is another tool in the toolbox to help us do so. But I think the number's been said. We have 256 groundwater basins, and at least 50 of them are being overpumped. And so what do we do? There are some very uh, draconian options out there, and I think this is one of those carrots that we can apply to, to help make it uh, easier. Um, we know there are a lot of sticks out there. I think it's also important to note that uh, a, a similar proposal came forward in the 2021 legislative session with uh, an AB 356. Uh, it was brought forth by, uh, by state officials then, and I think there's been a long discussion uh, ever since the last session about, you know, we can support this idea, uh, get a good coalition together. And so there's been a lot of folks working on this for, uh, for quite some time. As you've seen, I think, um, you know, we, uh, this isn't about enriching folks with, with, who have paper water rights or water speculators. This is about doing the right thing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Patrick Donnelly with the Center for Biological Diversity. I think uh, you all are going to have a lot of water bills come in front of you this session. I think 25 is my count. Uh, this may be the most important one. Um, uh, the retirement of water rights is an urgent crisis uh, solution to address an urgent crisis across the state, which is overappropriation. I think the, the points Senator Flores made earlier about the lack of full knowledge, especially about the current status of perennial yield, you know, what is that in a modern climate? That is true. We need to put resources into calculating basin budgets. But as was said, you know, the priority with this bill is focusing on basins where we already know there's overappropriation. Springs are drying up. Wetlands are drying up. Wells need to be deepened. And so 
the exact number of the perennial yield of that basin probably needs to be recalculated based on modern science, but we're seeing the impacts, and so it seems like the appropriate time to address them is now while we can still save what we have. Um, I think, to me, the only question here with this bill is how much money we can get put into it. Uh, you know, $5 million is in there right now. Um, that, is, that is a down payment, um, but ultimately it's going to take a lot of resources to bring these basins into balance. I think the amendment really offers avenues toward doing that. Um, because there's lots of incentives towards retiring these rights. It's not, just, uh, it's not just trying to make water rights holders whole, it's protecting the environment. You know, there are basins where there are critical environmental resources that are impacted by overpumping, where this could open up avenues to address that. And so, um, you know, you can tell by the breadth of people testifying on this bill that this really appeals to a wide sector of the water community in this state, and we urge you to support it. Thank you. For the record, Nina Laxalt representing the Nevada Cattlemen, and thank you for letting me go before Doug Busselman, who talks a lot longer than I do. <laughs> um, with that said, I, I want to agree with most everything that everybody said. That we, you know, this bill is dealing with the most critical areas, and that's you know, with with anything that we deal with in life, we know that you know if something comes up, that's you know, your car can have a smashed window, your car can have you know, bugs in the dash or whatever, but as soon as the, you know, engine goes, that's what you're going to take care of, and that's what we're looking at is the engine in the state of Nevada. So we have to deal with this, and the nice thing about this bill is that it is a disincentive to curtailment and doing quite the opposite, as a matter of fact, and providing incentives. And so um, this is not the panacea to the water problems in the state of Nevada. None of these bills are. They are, however, many tools that will put together a framework that the Senator was talking about to make up for the mistakes that have been made in our 150 plus years of the state of Nevada. And um, I think it, it goes along with the curtailment of, of uh, with curtailment, but conservation, the data collection, everything, every single one of these things you listen to are a piece of the puzzle to help solve the problem. So with that, this probably is the most crucial one. I agree. Thank you. For the record, I'm Doug Busselman. I'm the Executive Vice President of Nevada Farm Bureau. We are well aware of the many issues that we have across the state with over-appropriated and over-pumped groundwater basins. We see this as a critical issue that needs attention. We need tools and processes which will be used in bringing these basins back into balance with their perennial yields. SB 176 is one of the concepts that we support and believe it needs to be available. Farm Bureau policy states that we support a water buyout retirement program as a mean to solve overappropriation. We further support the purchase from willing sellers and believe that the programs need to be operated in a fashion that will not significantly diminish another property owner's property rights. We've been closely following the ongoing fine-tuning and refining of the original proposal and are supporting in concept a number of these ideas floating around to make the buyout retirement program more effective. Hopefully, the latest version of the ideas will be incorporated into SB 176 and will be able to make a final determination on our position as the legislation goes forward. We think that there should be a priority in getting this program underway in the areas of the state which need the greatest attention. Overpump basins should be at the top of the list for that attention. We also believe that the purchase should be of wet water, and once purchased, the water rights must be retired on a permanent basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Pazina, members of the committee, Andy Belanger with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. We, too, are here in support of SB 176 um, and the conceptual amendment. We obviously will want to see the final language and sign off on that when, uh, when we're at that point. I do want to note, uh, particularly to Senator Hansen uh, and his line of questioning, the, the Water Authority came to the legislature in 1997 and 1999 and established a Las, the Las Vegas Valley Groundwater Management Program. And that program has had in operation since 1999 a well conversion grant program where we have taken domestic well owners and revocable permits out of uh, production based upon willing people who wanted to volunteer 
to, to connect to the municipal water system. That program has been very successful. And, and the legislature, when it created that program, created a funding mechanism for it. So every well owner in the Las Vegas Valley pays up to $30 per acre foot or $30 for a domestic well. And that has given us the, the, the monetary resources on an annual basis to help fund those conversions. It, it's a remarkable program. It's addressed a lot of specific Las Vegas groundwater issues. And I think it's a model for the state um, to consider, not in this bill, um, but at some point in the future, after everyone's gotten comfortable with, with funding uh, these sorts of programs and then establishing uh, the, the uh, water right retirement uh, process, then having local governments have the authority to create funding mechanisms to address this on a longer term basis, I think is really, really important. And it gives the local folks control over those things. So not for this bill but something to think about as you're developing policy in this area long-term. Wade Polson, General Manager, Lincoln County Water District. We support SB 176. Um, we believe that the state appropriated the water in each of these basins, and as they get over-appropriated, they, es they establish that. So the payment of, of retiring the water rights is only right to make the the person who went in with good faith to apply for a water right receive the water right and then build their livelihood on that water right it's only fair to compensate for that and for the retirement of the water rights as they get over appropriated as the basins get over appropriated that's the way to go um, we support this because we need another tool in the toolbox to help the state engineer be able to bring these basins into balance. And if we don't start today, it'll never happen tomorrow. So we believe that by doing this, we start this process now. And as it evolves and as it, we start to add to it, that it will become a program that will be effective for everybody in the water world and everybody that has water rights. So thank you very much, and uh, we support SB 176. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Isaac Hardy, representing Nevada Conservation League. Uh, keep it short and sweet again. Um, we uh, just want to echo the testimonies you've heard today. We are in full support of SB 176. Uh, and thank you very much. All right, is there anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support of SB 176? BPS, do we have anyone on the phones who'd like to testify in support? If you would like to testify in support of SB 176, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Paula Luna. I'm the operations manager for Battleborn Progress. We are in support of SB 176. Water conservation is a top concern for a lot of residents in the state. It's certainly one that, that it's certainly one for our members and our partners. SB 176 will provide a tool for reducing the overuse of groundwater, and we believe we should use everything at our disposal to conserve our water use. We thank the senator for sponsoring the bill and urge you all to support it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else BPS on the phones in support of 176? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. All right, anyone in Carson City in opposition of Senate Bill 176, please come forward. Seeing no one, BPS, let's turn it over to the phones. Is there anyone in opposition of Senate Bill 176? If you would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 176, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. 
Thank you so much. And that will bring us to neutral. For anyone testifying in neutral, please come on up. All right, seeing no one coming to testify in neutral for SB, oh, we do have someone coming to testify in neutral for SB 176. Thank you, Chair Pazina, members of the committee, Adam Sullivan, Nevada State Engineer, testifying neutral on this bill. This is a good concept. It's, it's, the bill is very well thought out. Um, it addresses one of the, the primary water resource problems for Nevada. Uh, there's been a lot of good testimony and questioning and answers, and I appreciate the committee's recognition of the complexities behind this. Um, now, as discussed by, by Mr. Tibbetts, for DWR to, to house a, a new program like this would be a substantial departure from DWR's current duties and capacity. There are some concerns, or there would be some concerns with the regulatory agency also having some authority for valuing water rights and purchasing water rights. Um, so as also discussed by Mr. Tibbetts, we, we've been in conversations with the bill proponents to talk about some alternatives to, to build the program not within DWR, but within a different structure within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources in a way that could still accomplish the objectives of the program uh, that, would, and that would also streamline some of the processes and avoid some of those potential problems that I just mentioned. Um, the state engineer would still be involved as a, or available as a technical participant in considering the the actual benefits realized by any particular transaction. And um, in, in, in that sense, we would be available and um, to, to participate and help with the overall objectives. And I look forward to continue to work with the bill sponsors to reach that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have you sit tight for just a moment as our state engineer. We value your knowledgeable opinion, and I believe Senator Flores had a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, obviously, you've had an opportunity to see how this works in other states. Um, if you could help differentiate um, how other states, where they house the program, um, and how it differs from what you see Nevada doing. Now, I, I understand we don't do it at all. Um, so the concern may be we just don't do it, and now we're tacking all these um, requirements on a particular office or, or job title. But if you could also just maybe provide some insight in how you've seen it work in other states and how you believe because of how they went about it from the kind of genesis, the onset of the program being created, how you think we could avoid some of those uh, landmines if you've had an opportunity to do that. And I, I honestly, through my, my own research, was trying to see how some of the programs originated and then how they've evolved with time um, because it's obviously when you see where a program is now, it's very different from where it initiated. So I'm just curious to know if you've had an opportunity to do some of that research and provide some insight or perspective on that. Adam Sullivan, for the record, I appreciate the question, Senator Flores. And to be honest, I don't have a lot of familiarity with how other states' programs have, have been developed and exactly how they worked. Um, I, I was paying close attention to earlier testimony about that myself um, because I have the same thought going forward for Nevada, there's a lot of opportunity to learn from others about what has worked and, and um, what could maybe be done better. So I think that's a, that's a valuable tool that we can take advantage of as a state. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else who'd like to testify in neutral here in Carson City? BPS, what about over the phones? You would like to testify in neutral to SB 176. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. I'd like to say, as the Senator comes back to make any final comments on this particular bill, that it's really gratifying to see so many 
people come together in support of this concept um, here and over the phone and that the senator had the opportunity to meet with so many to figure out how to make this work. It was a very thoughtful process, and we very much appreciate it here on Senate Natural Resources Committee. Senator Gokachia, would you like to make any final comments? With that said, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill number 176, and our final order of business will be public comment. If anyone would like to make public comment, either here in Carson City or over the phones, please do keep in mind that it should have no relation to either Senate Joint Resolution 3, Senate Bills 112 or 176. We welcome you to the front here in Carson City. Seeing no takers, BPS, do we have anyone over the phone? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. <laughs>